This morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments with the title, Preach Through the Pain. Preach Through the Pain. You say, Pastor, God didn't call me to preach. I watched the service last week, uh, Bishop Mitch Corder, which is a dear friend of mine and a phenomenal leader in his, in his own right, uh, a mentor in my life. And he said something, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it this, this morning, but pretty much his, a point that he had made at one time in his message is that we all are called to preach. Sometimes it's just to ourselves. The Word of God says, how will they hear without a preacher? Yes, some of us, God has called to preach and teach the Word of God in a public setting like this. Some God's asked to teach in, in, in classroom settings, but all of us have the ability to preach. And sometimes we think that the preaching is just left up to the guy that wears the suit on Sunday and holds the microphone. But the reality is our lives should be a living sermon. Our life should preach the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ every single day of our life. You have the ability to preach. And, and oftentimes, if you don't have another audience, you always have yourself to preach to. I wish every day when I got up and my feet hit the floor that I was just, this is the day the Lord has made and I'm just ready to go. But there's some days I have to convince myself of who I am in Christ. Because pressures of life start to overshadow us. Pressures and situations and to go with our text this morning, pain of life oftentimes begins to overshadow who we are in Christ. But I believe that the word tells us and reminds us that it does not have to be that way. You've heard me say many a times, Jesus declared, he says, you'll have trials in this life, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Sometimes that's the most powerful message you can preach is that to yourself in the mirror before you go to work. The most powerful message that you can preach is when you can look at yourself and say, oh, but he reminded me he will be there with me always, even until the end of the earth. He'll never leave me, he'll never forsake me. For I am more than a conqueror because of his love for me. For I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all I am ever asked or think. And I understand this situation is heavy on me. But I can see the other side of it. So therefore, if I can see it, he must want to do something even greater than that. And to finish that scripture, Ephesians 3.20, according to the power that works within you, the power that causes you to move through life. All of us will experience pain. All of us will experience different levels of pain. Some of you, there's pain in your marriage. Some of you, there's pain in, in your children. Some of you, there's pain in your ministry. Some of you, there's pain in your workplace. Some of you, there's pain in your extended family, some of you, there's pain with your neighbor. We all have different levels of pain. Some of you, is physical pain within your body. There, pain comes and goes, ups and downs. Sometimes it's just mental pain. Sometimes it's nothing physical, it's just mental. There's a, there's a mental battle taking place. And a few weeks ago, I preached a message titled, Shake It Off for Purpose Sake. And some of you were here for that, and we were in the book of Acts chapter 28. And on my time away this, this past week, I always try to, when I'm gone, not only to be refreshed with my family, but also to refresh my spirit man as well. So I typically try to start a new book when, I, when I'm away to, to feed myself as a leader. I tend to try to dive into scripture and take a passage of scripture and just refresh myself of what the word is to where I don't have to preach or teach, but it's just for me. And so during my time, I just couldn't get away from that passage of scripture, so I began to study it deeper. And this morning, uh, we're going to start with two verses of scripture. 
um, uh, uh, actually three verses of Scripture from different parts, some that I have used over the past couple weeks, and I'm actually going to preach four books of the Bible this morning. Some of you got real nervous. Those of you that got excited, I love you, but I'm not preaching that long. Some of you know that, you know, God's gifted me to, to, to preach, and sometimes one thought can take me on a trail for a while, but I'm not going to do that this morning. But I'm going to highlight four books of the Bible very quickly to you that was written at a time of pain. Everybody say pain. I first want to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. And I'm actually going to read this one out of two different translations. And we're going to start with the New Living Translation this morning. It reads like this. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Somebody say others. So he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 in the Message Bible, I like the way it reads it. It reads like this. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. He comes alongside of us in trouble and in painful moments. So that at the right time before you know it, you have the opportunity to use your pain as a ministry opportunity to somebody else's pain. He comes alongside of us as believers to strengthen us so that we can strengthen someone else. He comes alongside of us so that he can encourage us so that we can be the encourager to somebody else. And then I want to go back to Acts chapter 28 that has sparked all of this study in my personal life. Acts 28, beginning with verse 30. This is Paul. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God. Somebody say boldly. Boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop him. Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning, Father. It's the word that's sharper than any two-edged sword, Father, and I pray that it ministers to your people today and your anointing will rest upon me as I teach it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate the word this morning? I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful that the word is alive because it allows us to take a few scriptures such as this and unfold many life lessons and principles from this. Today's title is Preach Through the Pain. Everybody say preach through the pain. Preach through the pain. Preaching is not just about microphone and platform. Preaching is about passion. Some of you say, well, pastor, you get a little loud. I'm sorry, that's just because I get excited in delivering the word of God. I get excited about the life that comes from the word of God. I'm a loud person to begin with. My wife has to live with me being loud. I am loud constantly. My daughter Alexis is loud. She gets it from me. She, is, she can't do anything quiet. Colson's a little bit quieter, but he has this stomp. He walks heavy-footed. So you always, I, we were in the grocery store last night. We've been gone for a week and didn't have anything in the house. And we were in the grocery store, and I, and I, I, I couldn't find everybody. But on a few aisles over, I heard, I said, I don't know if the rest of them were there, but that's Colson. And sure enough, there he was, slapping his feet on the ground, just walking around. He's going to be a drummer. So he may not say much, and he may not speak loud. Oh, but he can make loud noises. When he sees a spoon and a fork, he thinks drumsticks. And I think another damaged table. So I'm... I'm loud because I get excited and I get passionate about delivering the word. You don't have to be loud to preach. God just asks you to be who you are, but be passionate about who he is. And when you take your passion and collide with his purpose, 
all of a sudden your life story begins to preach to people around you. It begins to preach to your family. It begins to preach to your coworkers. It begins to preach to your neighbors. It begins to speak to the painful situations of life. While I was on vacation, I had just received a new book by Dr. Sam Chan, and it would, the title of it was Leadership Pain. And I thought that was interesting, being that I was already studying this passage of Scripture that will make more sense in a few moments. And so I began to read, and I opened up the first page, and Samuel Chan made this statement. He said, don't run from your pain. Don't deny it exists. It's the most effective leadership development tool the world ever has ever known. You'll grow only to the threshold of your pain, so raise it. And I thought, this is going to be an exciting book. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wow, that's great for a leader to read. That's a great leadership quote. Here's what I know about leadership is if you are in Christ, you need to lead. Leadership, actually I wore this suit this morning as part of illustration to say this is what we picture as an important person or leader so often. If you have the right outfit on, if you have the right tie on, and you have the right amount of starch in your shirt, if you have the right look and the right appearance, then you're a leader. Leadership is not about power, title, or position. It's about influence. All throughout the scripture, we see where there's leaders. We see that there was a woman that was a leader. Oh, she had an issue that caused her to be an outcast by society. But she showed people what the, it was to push through pain to get to the hem of the garment of Jesus to be healed. Where others were mesmerized in the moment, she led by example to say, I'm not here to, to just see him pass by, but I'm here to touch him. So if that means I've got to get dirty in doing that, then I'll do it. All throughout the word of God, we find that a, a little boy would show up where there's a multitude of people. And the Bible says that there was 5,000 men. So that's not counting women and children. And the disciples are saying, Jesus, we should probably let these people go because it's getting late and they're hungry. And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, well, feed them. And they start thinking, well, we didn't prepare for this. We didn't have this. But a little boy was a leader. He stepped up and he said, I don't have much, but what I do have is a few fish and some loaves of bread, and here it is. And the disciples then turn and say, we've got something. And the Bible says that because a little boy was willing to step up, it influenced the whole crowd. All throughout the word of God, we find where leadership is not about titles and positions and power given to us. It's not about the outfits we wear, but it's about the influence that we have in our life. And the, the reason I'm sharing this with you this morning is because I don't want you to be blinded by the pain in your life and think that you need a leader to show up to help you through the situation. I was reading this week and I ran across another story and it was about a young lady that was getting ready to go to college and, and she was applying for schools and she finally uh, she got the application for the school that she wanted to go to, and she was filling out the application. Then it came down to a question, and it asked this question. It said, are you a leader? And all of a sudden, then she got real nervous, and she actually, fear creeped up inside of her, because she's thinking, no, I'm not. So she said, well, I have to be honest, because once I show up at this small school, this small college, people's going to learn that I'm not a leader. So she checked the no box. Then she sent it off, and for a moment, her dreams were crushed, because she thought, that's it. I'll never get accepted. A few weeks later, by her surprise, she receives a letter in the mail from this college. And this is what the letter said. It said, Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel that all these new leaders, that it's imperative that they have at least one follower. It's amazing where honesty can take you. You have to be confident in who you are. That was just for fun. 
Paul. Let's talk about Paul this morning because that's the point of this message. Leadership is influence, and Paul shows us what leadership is by preaching through pains of life. Now, Acts chapter 28, to give you some brief background, Acts chapter 28, verses 30 and 31, and it says that for the next two years that Paul lived in a house that he paid for. Other translations say it was a rented house. But the bottom line is this. Paul was under house arrest. This was a form of imprisonment for Paul, awaiting trial. He is under house arrest. But as you read it in the New King James Version, tells us that they continue to allow him to have visitors. And Paul under house arrest, even though he could not get out into the community, and even though he couldn't find some, he couldn't get to the churches anymore to stand in their platforms and preach to them. Paul was under house arrest and he was isolated, but the mistake was they let people come to him. And so Paul refused to allow his moment of isolation to keep him from his purpose and to keep him from preaching. Now, as a preacher, as a pastor, man, it, it would drive me crazy being locked in a room or one house. I was ready to come home from vacation because I was tired of being in people's houses. When I was a child, one of the greatest ways my parents would, would discipline me, because it's the only way, they, 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 the only thing that would work for me is they would have to put me in a room by myself where there wasn't anybody to make laugh or to talk to because, man, I could take a piece of paper and turn it into a village. The way my mind worked. I can imagine Paul as a preacher of the gospel. For a moment he thought, house arrest, how am I going to be faithful? But he continued to preach through the pain. So what did he do during that time? Not only did they allow people to show up, and the Bible says he continued to preach the kingdom. Everybody say kingdom. He continued to preach the kingdom of God. He boldly proclaimed it to everyone that would come and sit down, and nobody tried to stop him from doing that. And during that time, Paul wrote four New Testament letters. During that time, Paul wrote Philippians. He wrote Philemon. He wrote Ephesians, and he wrote Colossians. During this time of isolation, Paul wrote four New Testament letters. We call them epistles. He wrote them from a time of isolation and imprisonment. What could have been a painful situation, I'm sure it was a painful situation in Paul's life, he decided to use it to produce and use it to advance the kingdom of God. I believe that what God can do in our painful moments, if we're willing in some way, shape, or form, and we can push past even the mental challenges, that God will use our pain to preach a message. Paul writes these letters, and he says, I may not be able to get to them, but I can send word to them. You can't silence me because I'm operating in purpose. And so Paul, we find, he wrote four letters. Let's look at... Philemon this morning. Philemon, as you study and you read it, you find that it portrays this message of forgiveness and restoration. Some of you are probably thinking, I never even read that book of the Bible because it probably got stuck to another page because it's only one chapter long. But it's an amazing story. Philemon was somebody that was a part of the Colossian church. And Paul ministered to him, and through Paul's ministry, Philemon received Christ. Now, Philemon had a servant or a slave. Onesimus was his name. O-N-E-S-I-M-U-S. -E Onesimus was his name. This, this slave, now I, wanna, I want you to hear me very, very clearly. I don't want you to think of slave as we have been trained to understand that terminology. Actually, in this time, part of the Roman government, to be a slave was a job opportunity. 
this relationship between slave and master was more of like what we would know today as employer or an employee relationship. There was more slaves and there was people in the community because it was a it was a way to work. It was a way to provide it. They, they were a, a part of this. And actually, the, the more I began to study this, the more I began to, to be reminded that most slaves were economically better off than most free people. Masters would take good care of their slaves because they worked hard. And so what is taking place here is Onesimus steals from Philemon. And after stealing... He runs away and he goes to hide. Now this would be the, the equivalent of you robbing from your company. You have a job, you're paid to do a job, and then you get an idea that you're going to take something that's not yours and then you're going to run and hide and they send the authorities out looking for you. This is what Onesimus did. Philemon received Christ through Paul's ministry. Onesimus steals from him as one of his slaves, and he runs and hides. But isn't it amazing how God can order our steps even in the midst of our issues and chaos? Because you know who Onesimus runs into when he goes to hide? A man named Paul. He runs by this house where Paul is under house arrest. And Paul invites him in and preaches the kingdom to him, tells him about Jesus. Now Onesimus is now a believer just like Philemon, just like Paul. Now Onesimus has given his life to Christ. And so when Paul writes to Philemon, he writes a message of restoration. He writes and he tells Onesimus, he says, you need to go back and make it right. Now follow me this morning. This would be like you robbing from your company, going to hide, and now you're just going to think you're going to show back into the boss's office and say, yeah, I'm back and you need to forgive me. Would that work out for you? So I'm sure Onesimus is thinking, because at this time, if, you, if, a, if, a, if a slave or a servant did something of this nature, you would face trial and most likely you would be put to death. Because they can't trust you anymore. Onesimus was really putting his life on the line to go back to Philemon. But Paul writes a letter in the midst of isolation. Paul writes a letter of reconciliation. And he tells Philemon, you are not to look at Onesimus as a, as a slave any longer. But you are to look at him as a fellow believer. Because now where you once were separated, you are now once together. Because you are both covered under the blood of Jesus. The book of Philemon is about restoration it's about forgiveness. You say, Pastor, what does that have to do with us this morning? Listen, it's so easy for us to become enslaved to people that have hurt us. Paul is put in prison for preaching the gospel. He's under house arrest for preaching the gospel of Jesus. He has been wounded by some folks. Do you remember the beginning of Acts chapter 28? We had some fun with that passage of scripture a few weeks ago because it says that when Paul gets to the island and, he, and, he, and they, they, they prepare a fire for him and they celebrate him, but then he gets bit by the snake and now they, they start bringing up his past saying he is a murderer, he's just going to go and die. And so they went to celebrate him, then they wanted him to die. Then when they realized he didn't die, they made him a god. People are unstable. That's what that passage of scripture tells me. If you're looking for security in man, you are looking for a very unstable place of security. You are, if you are looking for your affirmation just in man, just understand one moment they'll celebrate you, the next moment they want to kill you, and then when you survive it, then they want to be your best friend and say that you're a god. They put you on a pedestal that you're just going to fall off of, and as soon as you fall off that pedestal, they're just going to kick you to the curb again. Paul knows what it is to be hurt by somebody. But yet, in the midst of isolation, he writes a powerful letter with a few words 
to bring reconciliation to two people that needed it. Paul, in the midst of being hurt by man, finds it important to use that painful situation to make sure that that there is a reconciliation, that there is restoration between two men that needed it because at one time they were both sinners, but now that they've come together and now that they are saved by the grace of God, that they are no longer master and slave, but they are together as fellow believers. Let me tell you something this morning. Let me encourage you. Your painful situation might be the hurt of man but you can still walk in forgiveness. You've heard me say this before. Somebody's got to be the bigger person. No, we're not always perfect. But that situation where you think there can be no restoration, that seems to be impossible. Paul, after being hurt by people, writes a letter. What does he do? He preaches through the pain to see restoration of man. I've told you before, and I'll say it again. As your pastor, it is never my intention to make light of your issues or your situation. I'm not up here to try to make you feel like you're a bad person because you're walking through pain. What my goal is to encourage you in the midst of pain to help you understand that you can be more of a conqueror, that the pain doesn't have to steal the spiritual anointing that's in your life. Paul writes a letter to Philemon about forgiveness and restoration. Some of you, God wants you to be the bigger person to offer forgiveness and restoration. You're sitting there and you're praying and you're saying, Lord, if you would just convict them. Lord, if you would just change them. Let's use a good Old Testament term. Lord, if you would just smite them. And he's saying, I want you to be the hand extended. I want you to have forgiveness in your heart before I can make forgiveness in the relationship. He says, I want you to be restored in your heart before I can bring restoration in the natural situation. That's the letter Paul writes after being hurt by man. He writes a letter of restoration and forgiveness to man. The second letter that he writes is Ephesians. Everybody say Ephesians. He writes Ephesians. Ephesians is a, is, a, is a great book of the New Testament. I, I love Ephesians. Ephesians has some great power quoting scriptures. I just quoted one earlier, Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we may ask or think according to the power that works within you. Ah, man, that's great stuff. That, that, that'll, that'll, that'll fire us up, man. That'll get us excited. I mean, Ephesians has some, has some great. I'm not even going to preach Ephesians 5 because some of you men get that all mixed up. Some of y'all are like, what's he talking about? Just read it yourself. There's some great, powerful scriptures in, 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 throughout the books of Ephesians. But yet Paul wrote it in a time of imprisonment. Paul wrote about he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. Paul wrote about freedom. Paul said after you've done, that's where Paul declares, after you've done all you can do to stand, stand therefore. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers, against the darkness of this age. Paul understood those words very clearly because he was under house arrest. And I guarantee you, there was a spiritual battle going on in his mind. And he was just making declaration. I know about a spiritual battle because I'm going through one right now. But the underlining message of, of, of Ephesians is very simple. It wraps around a word that we know as unity. Unity that all believers, everybody say all believers. That all believers are united in Christ because the church is one body of Christ. Everybody say one. Paul is saying, don't, don't, you stop wrestling against each other. It's a spiritual battle. We are one because Christ has made us one. So stop going your separate ways. You get up and you put on your armor. You put, that's where Paul begins to teach about the fivefold ministries. And he talks about how there's different gifts that some will be called to be prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists. Paul writes out the fivefold ministry, what it looks like, because he's trying to say, just be unified. No, a prophet don't think like a pastor. Um, no. A teacher doesn't always think like a prophet. Don't think like apostles. But listen, when you all take your rightful place and you stand as the unified body, we're all members of the same body. We make up the body of Christ. So move in a spirit of unity. 
Isn't it amazing that in a moment of isolation, Paul preaches about unity? Paul doesn't think about, woe is me, somebody come break me out of this joint. Paul thinks, man, I'm isolated from them, but I'm going to declare to them that they need to walk in unity. They need to live in unity. Listen, in the midst of your pain, you are not isolated from the body of Christ. That's what excited me about being gone as, as, as your pastor on vacation when I would talk to people and they would say, well, so-and-so came by and prayed with me. So-and-so came by and read the word over me. So-and-so came by and sang with me. So-and-so came by and encouraged me. You know why? That was the body of Christ, and that was painting the picture that in isolation in a hospital room, you're not separated from this body of believers. Whatever your pain is that you're walking through, there's many that are in this house that you're walking through pain right now, but you still find a way to preach through it. And I want to encourage you this morning, when we read these books of the Bible, I'll just remind you that these are books, Paul wrote these in a, in a moment of, of pain and isolation, but they're still words that encourage us today. Are you thankful for that? Paul also wrote Philippians. Everybody say Philippians. There's an underlining message in, in, in Philippians. It's a three-letter word you see there on the screen, Joy. Everybody say joy. It's hard to say that word without smiling. Joy. Paul writes about joy as being content in all circumstances. Huh. Paul writes a letter reminding the Philippians the great joy of serving Jesus. See, when you read Philippians by itself, you're like, man, that's great. I need joy. But do you understand that the guy that wrote this was arrested for preaching the gospel? And he says, but there's great joy in serving Jesus? Most of us in our painful situation, we blame God and he didn't have anything to do with it. Paul is actually arrested for preaching this gospel message, but yet he says there's still joy in serving Jesus. Paul writes a letter in the midst of a painful situation, and his tone to the Philippians is that of gratitude. It's that of gratitude for them and his joy in serving God, even though it's the very thing that got him in a painful situation. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Philippians is a great book to go back and read and to be reminded that in all circumstances and all situations, you can still find joy. Why? Because our circumstances, our situations doesn't change who God is, and so therefore they haven't caught him by surprise, and they may not be going away as fast as you want them to. Let me remind you that Paul was in this situation for two years. Everybody say two years. He was in this for two years, but he maximized the opportunity to preach through the pain. Some of you are facing painful situations, but what if you turn that frown upside down for a moment and you found a spirit of joy that can only come through Christ? It's what Nehemiah said, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's that that gives us strength and the ability. The reason Paul could write a letter about the joy that he has in serving Jesus, the joy that he has in his relationship with God, even though he's under house arrest is because the joy that came through that relationship was unspeakable. It was a love that he experienced that was timeless, that was spaceless, that was boundless. It wasn't, it wasn't captivated to a public moment of preaching where everybody's applauding and everybody's singing your praises, but he found that even in isolation, he could have the same joy and fulfillment because Jesus never fails. He was the first one to write that song, Through It All, I've Learned to Trust in Jesus, I've Learned to Trust in God. That was his life message. Through it all, even in isolation, I can still trust in my Jesus. He writes a letter about restoration of the relationship. He writes a letter about a unified body while he's in isolation. He writes a letter about joy when he's probably not in the best mood. And then the last one that he writes is Colossians. Everybody say Colossians. Colossians centers around this thought of the completeness of the believer in Christ. Read Colossians sometimes. 
It's only five, four chapters. And you find in chapter one, he talks about their completeness of their faith and their sacrificial service for Christ. If anybody knew what it was to sacrifice for Christ, it was Paul. His life was a sacrifice. Chapter 2, he talks to him about how it's not about just philosophy and it's not about legalism, but it's simply about Christ. Chapter 3, he writes that it's not about carnality, but it's about Christ. It's not about your natural situation. It's about Christ. I love Colossians 3. You know that. I've preached that before. We wrapped our men's retreat around it because it's where Paul says to think upon the kingdom things. And then down around chapter 3, verse 15, it said that's when the peace of God shows up and, and begins to rule your life. And I've told you before that word rule translates to umpire. Umpire on a baseball field is a final authority. Isn't it amazing that in the midst of this isolation, in the midst of this painful process, in the midst of Paul's issue and his situation and circumstance, he says, but the peace of God. God can show up and he can rule all the situation. How was Paul able to preach through the pain of his life? Because he knew the peace of God. Everybody say peace. He wraps up Colossians in chapter 4 by telling them and challenging them to walk in wisdom and pray. Paul was a pretty wise man. What I want you to understand this morning is this is that your pastor can preach four books of the Bible that quickly. <laughs> Here's what I want you to understand. A man that had his natural freedom stripped from him wrote these letters. Why? Because they could not take his spiritual anointing. Oh, they could isolate him physically, but they couldn't stop what God wanted to do in the spirit. And how that applies to your life this morning is very simple. You might be in a situation that has your natural circumstances bound up. It may be as though you feel is your natural situation natural circumstances. Your life is in the grasp of something that is robbing purpose. But my friend, it can't take the anointing that God has placed in you if you'll understand that you have the ability to preach through the pain. Why? Because his word still reminds me that greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. All those that rise up shall fall. His word still reminds me that I can every day get up and put on the helmet of salvation and remind myself who I am in Christ. His word still reminds me that today is a day of salvation. His word still reminds me that I can be more than a conqueror because of his love for me. You've got to preach through the pain. Why? Because somebody is waiting on your story. Somebody is waiting on your testimony. Somebody is waiting on your pain to come alongside of theirs where you can all of a sudden not focus on your pain, but you can focus on the God that's walking with you so that you can walk with somebody else. And in the midst of your pain, you preach through it and all of a sudden you realize that you have the ability to help somebody else overcome theirs because you have faith in the one that will never leave you and never forsake you I want to wrap this up this morning these four books of the Bible they, they, they have their differences Ephesians and Colossians have some similarities Colossians and Philemon have some similarities because Philemon was a part of the church in Colossians. So they have some similarities. They also have their differences. But there's this underlining message that Paul writes from prison. <laughs> oh, I understand you might be under might not be under house arrest. But there's something that is trying to imprison your life. Bible says that the enemy is prowling like a roaring lion seeking and searching who he may devour. It may be somebody that stole something from you. It may be somebody that's bashed you. It may be somebody that's hurt you. 
It might be something that is trying to bring, uh, break unity in your life and in your spirit. But all of these messages, Miss Teresa, is an underlining message and a bold statement of who Christ is, that he is the image of God, that he is the source of all wisdom, that he is the head of the church, and that he is the one who reconciles us to God and with fellow believers. And he, as our Savior and as our Deliverer, the underlining message is he deserves our true, our, our, our pure adoration and praise. Why? Because in the midst of our pain, he's still God. So I want to know this morning, Heritage, can you put your hands together and offer up a praise to the God that is there for you even in the midst of your pain? Can you give him adoration? because he is worthy. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the way maker. He is the security. He is the one that declares you are the head and not the tail. You are the first and not the last. You are blessed coming and you are blessed going. He is the one that makes a way out of no way. He's the one that is the glory and the lifter of your head. He's the one that makes you a conqueror. He's the one that offers peace. He's the one that offers strength. Can you throw your hands up to him all across this house? Can you lift your voice and just love on him for a moment? with praise coming up out of your spirit because he is the one. He is the one that will help you preach through the pain of your life. You may not ever hold a microphone and stand in a pulpit with a suit on, but you have the ability to allow your life to declare the goodness of your God in the midst of your pain. This type of stuff excites me because through it all, we can trust in Jesus. Through it all, we can depend on him. Through it all, we can walk confidently in him. And through it all, he'll use your life to declare his goodness I'm thankful I'm thankful that Paul preached through pain I told you a story not too long ago of Oswald Chambers and his wife Gertrude how Oswald Chambers was I'll give you the short form this morning he was a British military chaplain that was sent to Egypt and in the shadows of pyramids every day, he would get up and he would offer these devotions to, to the Egyptian um, army, to the British army. And all of a sudden, his, his wife Gertrude, she would sit and she had the ability to take shorthand very quickly. And she would take all these stories that he would tell and these devotions that he would do and she wrote them down. Oswald Chambers, in, in, during that time period, he became very ill and he died. He left his family with nothing. His wife Gertrude goes back and with, a, with a baby, and she lives in a boarding house with not a penny to her name. She's out trying to make ends meet. But every night, she would go down to a dark basement and light a candle. And she would begin to take these devotions that Oswald Chambers taught. And she began to put them in story form. And out of a basement with nothing but a candle from a woman that was in isolation with a baby with no money, she wrote a book that is on many of your bookshelves. She wrote a book that has sold over a million copies, not counting the, the journals and the calendars and the children's books that have been derived from that story. She wrote a book that has been translated into 39 different languages. She wrote a book that is known as the most popular religious book ever written. And it's called My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers. Many people don't know Gertrude's name. But she was the one that in the midst of pain preached through it. Paul wrote some letters that still inspire us today. That book, My Utmost for His Highest, many of you own probably have an app on your phone with it. Why? It came from somebody that preached through pain. Last week, before Sister Denham went into surgery, some of you came by the hospital and you gathered around her bed and not knowing the outcome of the surgery, she was singing, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When I talked to her at seven o'clock on a Sunday, last Sunday morning, I said, are you ready? And she said, I'm just ready to get this over with so I can get back to my ministry. 
I said, one, all right, praise the Lord. This church is a testimony of people preaching through pain. I could stand and tell stories upon stories upon stories. When I stood with Marsha Walker a few weeks ago, I, I popped by the hospital just as the time the surgeon was coming in and she's about to face open heart surgery. Is she here this morning? I thought I saw you back there. Put your hands together for Marsha. <laughs> she just came home from the hospital. I loved her faith. The doctor's coming in and he's telling about the procedure. And I said, and, and you know, etiquette, you know, I'm, I'm not family, so I'm go to leave the room. No, pastor, you stay here. So I go and I sit in the corner like a good little boy. And he's trying to talk about the procedure and Marsha's just trying to lead him to Jesus. Finally, he gets, he gets done uh, and, and she says, do you believe in prayer? Now, I don't know this man. I'm, well, I'll just stop there. He says, it doesn't hurt. And she said, good, my pastor's here and he's going to pray for you. I said, <laughs> I said, I'm just a good little boy sitting in the corner minding my own business. Just trying to get me thrown out of this hospital. You know what? We didn't break out into tongues and I didn't get a five-gallon bucket of oil and dump on his head. But we joined hands around her hospital bed. And we prayed that the anointing of the Lord would be on him as he touched the vessel of the Lord. Through the pain, she preached a message. Through the pain, he preaches a message. Through the pain, there's a message being preached. I could start pointing fingers around this place. So believer, listen, it's a simple message this morning. Preach through the pain. Because if Paul would have given in to the pain, would we have ever had Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians to encourage our life? He was the one that the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit came on to pen the words so that you could be ministered to today. Through it all, we learn to trust in Jesus. Through it all, we learn to trust in God.